Um, then I explored the Middle Western heartland, like many in the late, late 1920s. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Um, so I was doing research at libraries at the same time I was photographing these old towns in the ground. I was trying to find out who lived there, what it looked like, and it turns out the in the West there's a lot of great collections of old pictures from the 19th, early 20th centuries. And um, I would spend three or four days just dig digging in the archives, and I was traveling in this camper, and, and I had a refrigerator that was only full of film. And, uh, and, but I would cook breakfast. I, 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 I parked across the street from the Denver Public Library for four nights, and I slept in, the, in a parking. This is before people were getting tight about things like that. And so I would sleep in there, and then I'd get up, and I'd put on a tie and walk across the street and do research all day. Then I'd go back and sleep and go back the next day. And when I was cooking breakfast, the, the smells would sort of emanate from this van and people would go by, what am I smelling, this bacon here or something? <laughs> then I explored the Middle Western heartland. Like many in the late 1920s, my mother's father had closed his general store in a small Ohio town and moved his family to California. In the, gold, in the Corn Belt in Upper Midwest, between the Ohio River and the Canadian border, I found clues to our historical identity as the practical God-fearing, progress-minded middle Americans who continue to plant the seeds and mind the store. In New Orleans, I pursued another longtime passion, traditional jazz. I hung out with and photographed many of the earlier generations of musicians who created America's most original and enduring art form. I also learned why New Orleans has been called the most European city in America. Three books of pictures and text came out of these journeys. Extension of the eye and constant companion, my camera remained an essential window on the world of people. Searching for and finding inner meanings and outer phenomena remain, remain my modus operandi. This is in Bodie, California. I seem to have all these sleep stories. I, I, you, it's a state park and you had to leave at five o'clock, but the light was just getting good then and I could see it would be even better at five or six in the morning. So all the cars left and the guy that I'd ridden there with, I said, just leave, leave me here. What are you gonna do? Never mind, no so I slept overnight in the jail there and there were rats running around, it wasn't too great, but I got the, some great pictures. This is, a, this is a church in Bodhi. That's a town called Rhyolite in Nevada, a former bank hope some, some of our banks don't start looking like that. <laughs> this is in New Mexico, cleaned out, busted out, old mining town. This is uh, near Jerome, Arizona, and I, I particularly like this kind of symbolism of the crosses across the street from the trailer park. <laughs> so, I broadened my reach a little bit, and um, this is actually in the Seattle World's Fair. <clears throat> this is in Marin County, some hippies, and I looked really at the microscope, they came from Illinois, that van, but I don't know, it tells you something about the era. And th this series is the Middle West. This is southern Indiana. This is hog judging at the state fair in Indianapolis. Also at Indianapolis State Fair. Everybody flies over the Middle West who lives in the coast and they never, and it looks like patterns with some sprinkler things gone there, but it's really not easy to get into the life of the people and the people themselves are, what do you, why would you want to do a book about us? That's very Midwestern too. And uh, this cafe in Southern Illinois could be anywhere in America. I was just that moment spotted by the guy at the back who <laughs> was not too sure about me, but I was sure about I had a good picture.
those are some Native American Indian guy boys. Uh, on, at, at the water behind them is Lake Superior in Minnesota. They're sharing a smoke. And this one is in Detroit. Picture, I knew it when I took it, but the, the white of, of the sidewalk and so forth was so bright, everything was just, and I knew I could never print it, and I, and I was right, I could never print it. And I waited and waited, and I, when I was doing this book, I went through all my old pictures. And this picture became printable because of digital technology. I was able to scan it and uh, enlighten the, that extreme brightness range. So it's a very interesting time to be living through film and digital. Uh, there's examples in the past of um, Titian's time in the 16th century Venice. Uh, he learned the old techniques of painting on, on uh, wood with uh, tempura. And it, and it would dry immediately, and they had to be exactly correct. He learned that way, and then along came oil on canvas and everything changed. Titian became a master of oil on canvas. The paint would stay for days. You could swirl it around, overpaint, um, build it up with impasto layers. But I think living in between two er technical eras, a major technical change in an art form is a very interesting thing. And I'm actually glad to hear that these days at art schools that they are teaching darkroom work, even though hardly any of their students will actually do it, but you learn things that you apply later. And I, that, to me, that's one of Titian's uh, great advantages, is being able to span both. We don't have any Titians around today, but maybe we will. I think his sideburns tell you something about the 70s. <laughs> um, just some folks chatting on the bank of the Mississippi River, one thing I learned a lot about in, in the West was, Middle West, was how important rivers were in our history. This again could be many places in the United States. This is a, a little out of sequence, but it's in a town called West Piston, Pennsylvania. It's a small town for the first time it's been all over the newspapers in the last week. They had the worst flooding in, in the Susquehanna River, some 40 some feet. And I'm sure that this was all completely underwater. Sometimes pictures have this eerie kind of resonance. Something happens later. This is, guess where, New Orleans. And that's D.D. D. Pierce, a wonderful trumpet player from New Orleans. He was, uh, we told stories about him and I knew, I knew him well. Preservation Hall band started playing at Stanford in the 60s and 70s. That's when I first got to know them. And uh, I tr uh, ended up playing a few times in Preservation Hall and traveling with them on, on the, some of their bus trips as a photojournalist, not as a musician. I, and um, I just, there was a special subculture of those guys uh, who created America's most original and enduring and influential music. Now we come to uh, Italy. This uh, title of this chapter is Gift of Place. I was fortunate to spend a month, a year, for 20 years starting in 1988 in a 150-year-old far former fi farmhouse outside Amino, a small village in northern Italy. My wife, Ulla, a German citizen, had bought a two-acre property many years earlier. While getting to know a number of local people and welcoming European family and friends as guests, we continued to repair and improve the ruined structure with its thick stone walls, generous gardens, and surrounding forest. Meanwhile, I explored Piemonte with my camera, plural cameras. Europeans tend to approach their rural landscapes and towns differently than do Americans. Sustainer of civilization for millennia, agricultural land is infused with values beyond the commercial. Rural towns, most famously Italian hill towns, are organic units, not happenstance collections of unrelated structures. Their residents never think, for instance, of painting their homes in other than traditional colors. In 1988, and 
1999, I photographed Monte Mesma, our 600-year-old local monastery, and presented an album of prints to its father superior, Padre Corrado. A decade later, Corrado had been transferred, but we discovered that his Franciscan brothers had carefully taken the album apart and posted the pictures along the stone walls of their flower-bedecked courtyards. So I have, I have to tell you, I would try, I, I'm not great with languages. I did the best I could to learn Italian. And um, so there was a guy, I'll, get to, I'll, get, I'll tell the picture when I, tell, tell you the story when I get to the picture. Uh, this is a, a, a farmer nearby. That's his son on the left and his wife. They're, those people work so hard. I'm, I am not sure if those elderly ladies were sisters, but or twins. They sure seem like it. I only saw them for a second, and it, another. It's one of those offbeat compositions, like the Louis Armstrong one. Okay, so here's here's the the picture I want to tell you about. These people lived across the street from friends of ours, and I met them, and because the friend was saying hi to them, and I liked how they looked so much. They said, I don't have my camera. Can I come back tomorrow and take your picture? Oh, sure, sure. So I came back, and they're, you know, in their upper 80s. They'd forgotten all about it, of course. <laughs> they weren't there. I wandered in this village, which is a, a village of about 100 people, and I found a woman walking their little dog, and I reminded her of this. Oh, she said, fine, good. My husband, he's just over the hill there. He's picking some figs. Um, and he'll be back. So I got her sat down on, on this bench and he appeared carrying his bucket full of figs. It was in the, about this time of year. And um, so with my halting Italian and the politesse, he, he gave me a fig, which I didn't need because it was going to get all over my hands. I was really playing the photographer with a tripod and the camera and the whole thing, and um, so he said, well, he was sitting down, so where do you come from and what do you do? I said, I come from California and I'm a photographer. Oh, he said, you're a professional photographer. I said, yes. I said, well, he said, then I should pay you for taking my picture. I said, no, no, you can pay me with figs. Now, here's where the tricky part came in. Uh, one fig is fico. That's masculine. It's uh, two figs would be fiki. That's a plural masculine. But I said fike, which is the plural feminine. And it happens that that word, the singular of that in truck driver Italian means vagina. So they both collapsed with laughter. And I got my picture, and I didn't know why. <laughs> That's what they're laughing about. You can pay me with fika. So <laughs> it happened that same night, this man, the head of the monastery, of all people, was, came to dinner. He's one of these New Yorker type monks about this big around with the rope, the whole deal, long thing. Very nice guy, he loved to eat, of course. And I told him what happened. He said, sit down, my son. <laughs> you have to be very careful with that word. In it was, his tone was like, you know, go and sin no more. <laughs> That's a, a, a typical garden in, in that small town with the lake, Lake Orta in the background. And this is a scene, I went back for several years in a row because I wanted this scene, but I didn't like the real clear, nice weather every time. And so I, it took me several years before I came and it was perfect fog and rain, so I got this picture because I love the fuzziness of it. I don't know where else, maybe in India, but the, do they put saints on top of churches in that way? And this is, there's a little island in the middle of the lake, uh, and there's, there's a monastery on that island, and there's a walk around it that's made of these wonderful stones, and that day they it had just rained, and it, uh, this, for me, what makes the picture is that little puddle. <laughs> <laughs>